Welcome to this special Wesley's Chapel reflective service. Here we are in the fishing port of Newlyn in Cornwall, which is one of the locations that will feature in this service this evening. Now, last Sunday, we as Methodists celebrated the conversion of John Wesley when his heart was strangely warmed at a meeting led by the Moravians in Aldersgate Street in London. But that day in 1738 was also Pentecost Sunday, when the fire of the Holy Spirit descended upon Christ's apostles, filling them with a new sense of purpose and enabling them to speak to all people, whoever and wherever they were. John Wesley was also filled by that same Holy Spirit many, many centuries later. So what happened after that highly charged religious experience? Well, this evening we're going to look at how John and his brother Charles, who indeed had had a similar experience three days before, shared and evangelised their newfound fire in their hearts, especially here in the far west of Cornwall, amongst the working people in this land, the tin miners, the fishermen, the farmers and labourers. And it's the colours of Pentecost Holy Spirit that will colour our service tonight. The reds, the oranges and the yellows of the glorious sunsets that are seen almost every day at this tip of Britain. So let us start the worship with a prayer. Almighty God, in this season of Pentecost, when the fire of the Holy Spirit dwelled in the hearts of the disciples, Open our hearts and our eyes to the people and places that need to hear and receive your amazing love and grace. In a time of great need, you raised up your servants John and Charles Wesley, and by your Spirit, you inspired them to preach and kindle an inextinguishable flame of sacred love amongst so many in history. Give us that sense of purpose and commitment, so we, we too can share and spread the wonders of God's love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
So here we have John and Charles Wesley, all fired up, inspired and impelled to spread the gospel of good news, the gospel of salvation for all people, and they jumped the 18th century massive social class divide to do this. But they were faced with opposition. They were treated as a threat by many clergy in the established Anglican Church, who in turn employed violent mobs to try and stop them. Abuse and even dead animals and stones were hurled at them. But the brothers kept on preaching salvation. They knew the Holy Spirit was inextinguishable and that gave them power to endure. We now hear from the Gospel of Luke how centuries and centuries ago Jesus Christ faced similar opposition from his own hometown of Nazareth, speaking with the power of the Spirit, declaring his purpose of proclaiming the good news to all in synagogue. But the truths he told angered the establishment. Luke chapter 4, 14 to 30. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and rolling it he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself and you will tell me. Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Seraphath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd, and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Opposition of all sorts didn't deter Wesley from visiting Cornwall, a county that both brothers returned time and time again, 33 times to be exact, and during all weathers the West Country could throw at them and tolerating torturous journeys, mostly done on horseback. Now, outdoor preaching was their trademark. In fields, on cliffs, on stones, on beaches, and later on in a grass-covered pit called Gwennet Pit. Now, here were two educated gentlemen, Anglican priests, in the outdoors proclaiming their good news of hope through faith in God, to the poor working people of this land, the rough Cornish miners, the gnarly fishermen and hard-working farm workers. What courage this must have taken 
knowing at any time the violent mobs could have driven them, driven them out of town and thrown them off a cliff. But this evening I want to concentrate on one day of John Wesley's visit here in West Penwith in the summer of 1747. It was in July of that year and he first arrived in St Ives. He preached several times in the marketplace, he managed to navigate around the rowdy thugs and he continued on with his journey. First preaching at Golville Cross between Penzance and Marazion. From Golville he travelled on to St Just, an industrial town on the north coast of West Penwith a town of narrow granite mining cottages and dark satanic engine houses perched on cliffs. But some of the most dedicated band of Methodist miners were there. And John Wesley preached at 5 a.m. In, in the morning before the miners went to work in the deep mines under the sea. From there he walked to Morva, a little hamlet east of St Just. Its golden granite cottages haven't really changed much since those years, 250 years ago. Now behind this little church here in Morva, he preached from a stone in that field behind me, surrounded by the ancient Carnes and moorland of this north coast of Cornwall. Now he said in his journal that day, he preached to the largest congregation I ever saw at Morva. Then after Morva, he took the winding north road to the little hamlet nestled in a sheltered valley called Zena. And after attending service in the church there, he preached standing on a stone close to the churchyard wall. And a congregation of a hundred and a cow gathered around him. Now much of John Wesley's travelling was done on foot but in this case he was on horseback and by 5 p.m. on Sunday the 12th he was in Newlyn. In 12 hours he had preached in St Just, Morva, Zena and Newlyn. Now that is dedication but also spiritual endurance. But it's here in Newlyn where this story takes an interesting turn. Now Newlyn has been a fishing port for centuries, famous for its pilchards. It's just a few miles from Penzance and St Michael's Mount. And that afternoon Wesley was led to the local beach here called Tolkan Sands. And he proceeded to preach to a very noisy and rowdy crowd. Now, according to his journal, the wretches from Penzance threw him to the ground. But out of the crowd, a young Newlyn lad rescued him, brought him back to his feet, and the wretches of Penzance were sent packing. And Wesley continued to preach his message of unconditional love to the people of Newlyn. Listening to this message, the young rescuer, Peter Jaco, was brought to faith. Subsequently, Wesley took this young lad under his wing. He educated him to read and write, and that boy became a very notable Methodist preacher. In 1777, John Wesley made Peter Jaco the first superintendent minister of the newly built Wesley's Chapel in London, and he's buried in our graveyard at the back of that chapel. On his gravestone, a Charles Wesley inscription says, Fisher of men, ordained by Christ alone, immortal souls, he for his saviour won. This Wesley story has always struck chords with me, not only for the obvious personal reasons, both locations have equal importance to me. I spend a lot of my life bridging both London and West Cornwall, but both locations have shaped my spiritual life too, with Wesley's Chapel, where I am a local preacher and have been 
for the last 10 years and Mousel where I also live and preach. But it's been in the last three months that this story has resonated with me in a deeper way. Now if we bring in the story, story we heard earlier of Jesus' rejection, violent rejection by his hometown, I think there is a lot here that we can all relate to after having endured the plethora of emotions this pandemic has thrown at us. Being locked down in a small rural community in Cornwall has been at times challenging. The suspicion and fear of anyone from up country, as they say here, coming down from COVID-19 infected areas, especially London, has been rife. And that fear has erupted into misplaced anger and antagonism. And during the lockdown, the divide of suspicion between remote communities and urban areas have widened. And now with lockdown easing, the fear of the local communities has grown more and more. The suspicion of new people or people with new ideas is as old as time began. And Jesus came back to his hometown, a radically changed individual than the one people knew as Joseph, his, Joseph's son. And he was met with suspicion and anger. And in the 18th century, the county of Cornwall met the arrival of John Wesley with suspicion and fear. The remote parts of that county must have been very fearful of a gentleman from that far off place called London, preaching the message of salvation and love. But this story showed what preaching love could do. Out of conflict and suspicion, came something life-changing, something no one could have thought. An uneducated, teenage, pilchard fisherman from Newlyn, ending up preaching salvation from the pulpit of Wesley's Chapel in London. From what we've heard today, the power of the Holy Spirit can create a changed and warmed heart. That's the good news we all hope and pray for at this present time. But we also pray that the divisions caused by this crisis will be bridged by that amazing love that we have all witnessed in our neighbourhood, our community and in the wards of every hospital. That good news of Jesus Christ that John Wesley preached all those centuries ago here in Cornwall and throughout his lifetime is still of vital importance for all of us today. Let us aim to make it known through our lives by word and action for now and the future. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, from holy wisdom brooding on the waters of creation to the spirit with us now and enabling our worship, you have been gently and powerfully at work in our history. Within our darkest night, Spirit of the living God, breathing life into all that lives and loves, inspiring work and choices, guiding and molding, encouraging John and Charles Wesley, and in the life and friendship with all they met. You are still gently and powerfully at work in our world. 
within our darkest night. Within our darkest night, you kindle the fire that never dies away, and never dies away. Within our darkest night, you kindle the fire that never dies away, that never dies away. Spirit of the living God, from knitting us together in our mother's womb to embracing us while we draw our last breath, you are gently and powerfully at work in our lives. We pray for the needs of our lives. Within our darkest night. Within our darkest night. Spirit of the living God, we ask you to hold these ones whom we name in our hearts now who are in particular need. We ask for your comfort for those who mourn, especially those who grieve and are not able to grieve together with loved ones. Within our darkest night, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, freshen us, renew us, open our eyes to the needful tasks and our own abilities to fulfill the work. Enable us to be identified as God's people by our love and joy, our peace and patience, our kindness and generosity, our faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. May we shine as lights in the world to the glory of God. We praise you, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pader Agan Arloth Agan Tazni Uzi in Nev Benigis Rebo the Hano Re Thefo the Wlaskor Tha Voth Rebo Grez in Nor Kepar Hag in Nev Ro thin ni hedhu Agan Bara Pub Dethol Hagav thin Agan Camwith Kepa del Avenini then rena uzi o camwil er agan pinni. Hanara agan gora in temptation, mes de lirf ni the worth drog. Ragdiso gi uan wolaskor, han gallos, han gordians, bisvican habinari. 
Amen. And so, to close our Pentecost Day Teze service, let us hear some familiar words from a hymn of Charles Wesley, whose heart was strangely warmed at Pentecost 1738. Send us the Spirit of thy Son to make the depths of Godhead known, to make us share the life divine. Send him the sprinkled blood to apply, send him our souls to sanctify, and show and seal us ever thine. So go in peace, remain in peace. May the love of the Father enfold you, the wisdom of the Son enlighten you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you for whatever you have to face. Amen. <laughs>